Hello Miami University and all Oxford community. I'm Caroline. And I'm Cordelia, your co-host for tonight's show. Welcome back to Miami Television News. Last week, MTN reporters Caroline Mason and Sophia Centrella got to interview Dr. Cyan Proctor, the first African-American woman to pilot the spacecraft Inspiration4, the first all-civilian orbital mission to space. Here's a clip from the interview. You can find the full-length interview on our YouTube channel. Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Mason and I'm here with... I'm Sophia Centrella. Today we are joined by our special guest, a visionary futurist, explorer, and artist whose work bridges the worlds of science, space exploration, humanity, and creative expression, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. With advanced degrees in environmental science, geology, science education, Dr. Cyan Proctor made history when she became the first African-American woman to pilot a spacecraft, Inspiration4, the first all-civilian orbital mission to space. So let's jump right into the questions. Going back a little bit in your history, what first sparked your interest in space exploration? Was there a person or a moment that just really inspired you? Yes, I was actually born on the island of Guam. And the reason why I was born there is that my dad was working at the NASA tracking station during the Apollo missions. And so he, my family was on Guam for Apollo 11, the first you know, um, footprints on the moon. And what's interesting is that when the Apollo 11 crew came back from space, they did a tour of all the tracking stations around the world. So they came to Guam while I was still in my mom's belly, um, and my dad got to get Neil Armstrong's autograph, thanking him for all of his help. And then I, I was born, and my dad left working at the NASA um, tracking station, but I grew up with all of this NASA memorabilia to him on his office walls, and that just made me want to be an astronaut. That's so incredible. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I'm currently a female trying to break into the sports industry, which is another male-dominated field, um, and you've been incredibly successful with similar circumstances. So did you face any challenges regarding any gender barriers or challenges, and um, how did you overcome them? Yeah, you know, first I'm going to ask, what sports would you like to break into? I love basketball. Into That's basketball. That's my favorite. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, and the reason why I ask is because I'm an ice hockey player. Oh. And I did not become an ice hockey player until I was at grad school at Arizona State University. And, and so I, I always wanted to learn how to play, and so I took an, an adult learn to play hockey skills camp, right? And then one guy one day said, if you really want to get good, you've got to go and do pickup hockey every Wednesday, 10 o'clock. It's $10. So I show up. Mm -hmm. I'm the only female and, you know, a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And I show up, and the guys would not talk to me. They did not pass me the puck. And I remember I would take my shift. And, I, you know, they were really good. They were good skaters, and um, I was new. And, but I would take my shift and I'd go in up and down and then I would sit on the bench and they'd all be away from me. They wouldn't even sit near me. And I remember sitting there and I would tell myself, I paid my $10, I deserve to be here. And I showed up every single week and I wore them dudes down. That's awesome. Until the point where suddenly they would say, hey, and then they would pass me the puck and I would try to keep up with the play. Mm -hmm. And then I, I ended up going for an entire year every Wednesday skating and a year later, I became, I, I ended up being on Arizona State U Women's Club team and I was the captain for two years. That's and awesome. so it's about determination and realizing that you belong there. In years past, the Oxford Police Department has had some interesting stories to share with the public after large party weekends like Halloween. In their most recent weekend update on Facebook, they mentioned a few interesting cases from years past, like a foot chase with Scooby-Doo around the Oxford Dog Park, or a drunk driver getting his mug mugshot taken while wearing a breathalyzer machine costume. This year, however, we didn't get the same style of events. Oxford PD reported several cases of underage drinking and driving under the influence. Maybe next year we'll have some more interesting tales to tell. But in all seriousness, make sure if you are drinking, please do so responsibly. You might not be just endangering yourself, but those around you. Last week, MTN reporter Grace Wilson got to interview with Oscar-winning documentary maker Stephen Bognar. Here's a clip from the interview. You can find the full-length interview on our YouTube channel. Hello, my name is Grace Wilson, and today we are joined by Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker Stephen Bognar. So thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. Thank you. Well, thanks for having <laughs> me, Grace. I appreciate being of here. Of course, absolutely. So. He is most known for his documentary, American Factory, 
which is about a Chinese billionaire who opens up a factory in Dayton, Ohio, so very local to here. And the documentary dives into the story of the intersection of the Chinese working culture with the American working culture. So I wanted to just get into it and sort of ask you about your career in the documentary. Sure. So um, I wanted to ask you, what was the process of making the American Factory documentary like from the concept to the final cut? Wow, it was a three year journey, Grace, filming for three years and then 18 months of editing. So by the end and with all the travel we did, it was five years of our life uh, making the film. It was a great honor to to be on this journey to try to tell this huge story. But we also realized early on that we were inadequate to tell the story. Me and Julia, my, my partner, my late wife Julia Reichert and I, we were the directors of the film. And we started, it was like this dead factory was coming back to life and Americans were being hired. But Chinese managers and engineers were coming over from Fujian province, from Fuching, where Fuyao's, the company's called Fuyao. The headquarters of Fuyao was in Fuching, in Fujian province. They were coming to Dayton. For them, Dayton's like an outpost, right? It's like this weird, what is this place? But they were going to set up apartments and lives in Dayton, Ohio, for a year, for two years, before they go home. So they were not going to see their families for like two years. And when we were making the film, we were following the, the working folks from Dayton. It was fascinating to see the intersections, as you say, of Chinese culture and American culture. But we realized we were missing a huge chunk of the story because we're not Chinese and we don't speak Mandarin and we're not culturally Chinese. And we needed to find Chinese documentary filmmakers with whom we could collaborate. Miami University is set to begin offering fully online undergraduate degree programs starting next semester. Degrees such as English, cybersecurity, hospitality management, and many more will be available entirely online along with micro-credential programs in a variety of fields. Now heading off to sports, we have our sports anchor, Zoe Gutierrez. Hello, my name is Zoe Gutierrez and welcome to the Miami Sports Update. In week 11 of college football, the Red Hawks went on the road to face the Ball State Cardinals. Miami had its fourth straight win Tuesday by defeating Ball State 27-21. Brett Gabbert threw for 219 yards and three touchdowns, bringing him to 75 career touchdown passes. This moves him past Zach Dysart for second place in program history, only behind Ben Roethlisberger. This edition of the Redbird rivalry absolutely delivered in a monsoon monsoon. The game really went back and forth from start to finish, and it quickly began. After an opening interception, Miami would look to punt it away before Ball State's Brandon Berger picked off Alec Bevelheimer and took it the entire length of the field to give the Cardinals a 7-0 lead. The very next drive, Brett Gabbert responded by finding Reggie Virgil open for a 34-yard TD to tie the game at 7. The scoring on both sides continued as Ball State would kick two field goals in consecutive drives and Miami would score two touchdowns also on consecutive drives to give them a 21-13 advantage. The two drives for Miami saw Brett Gabbert continue to bully the birds by finding both Reggie Virgil and Kevin Davis open for a pair of TD passes. The third quarter was a low scoring quarter that saw Ball State even up the game at 21 after succeeding in the two point try late in the third. In the fourth, Miami's Dom Jobin made two clutch field goals both inside 40 yards to give Miami a 27-21 lead. At the end, it would all lie on the defense, where Miami's Ty Wise and Matt Salopek were able to sack Ball State's Caden Samanza in back-to-back -back plays. The defense answered the call, and Miami defeated Ball State for the fourth straight time, winning 27-21. Miami will face off against Kent State next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for round two of Maction. Onto the ice, Miami Red Hawks faced off against the RPI engineers this past weekend. Despite it being competitive, RPI took care of business and swept the Red Hawks on the road. In game one, RPI scored midway through the opening period, but seconds later, Miami tied the game thanks to Hampus Rydquist's goal and even it at 1-1 one one before the opening intermission. The Red Hawks grabbed a 2-1 lead with a power play from senior Matt Chapani. In the second period, the engineers tied up the game and soon took it to overtime to win 3-2 and stun Miami. 
The following night, RPI scored early in the second period, but Miami fought back less than two minutes later on its longest offensive zone possession of the entire season. Freshman Michael Quinn finished off the play, tying the game 1-1. One one. Tied 1-1, one one, heading into the third, RPI would score a game winner with only four minutes left in regulation to give RPI a 2-1 win and the sweep. In game two, Bruno Bruveres made 15 saves in net for the red and white. Coach Noreen and the Red Hawks will hit the ice again next weekend for a two-game two series against the Huskies of St. Cloud State in St. Cloud, Minnesota. On November 6th, the University Libraries, Humanity Center, and the Howe Center for Writing Excellence gathered in King Library for this year's celebration titled New Books at Miami. The event celebrated the induction of published works, specifically written by Miami faculty. Authors who were present offered micro-talks about their work. Among the authors speaking were Stephen Kahn from the Department of History, Emily Legg from the Department of English, and Rosemary Pennington from the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film. The Oxford Community Arts Center will host Empty Bowls, a benefit soup luncheon featuring ceramic works from local students on November 9th. Guests will get to choose a unique bowl to eat from and to take home, serving as a reminder that there are millions of people with empty bowls around the country. The cost is $15 per person and kids eat free. Proceeds will go to organizations that help supply foods for local families in need. Event organizer Oxford Empty Bowls encourages all to support local artists in this luncheon, which will be held from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you for tuning in to Miami Television News. I'm Cordelia. And I'm Caroline. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at MiamiMTN.